morning for our larger catechism reading, we will look at question number four and its answer. Question number four, not number two. <laughs> I've got to change that in the computer. Question number four is, how doth it appear that the scriptures are the word of God? The answer is, the scriptures manifest themselves to be the word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consent of all the parts, and the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, by their might and power, to convince and convert sinners, to comfort and build up believers unto salvation. But the Spirit of God, bearing witness by and with the Scriptures in the heart of man, is alone able fully to persuade that they are the very Word of God. This answer of the Catechism divides the response, how do we know that the Scriptures are the Word of God, into two realms of consideration. The first being the outward evidences that the Scriptures themselves present to us, that they are in fact the Word of God. Then secondly, that inward work of the Spirit of God, whereby we are enabled to recognize the outward facts that the Scriptures are indeed the Word of God. And these two must go hand in hand. If we do not have that inward work, then we will not appreciate the value of the facts that are before us. So the first part of the answer talks about those outward uh, notes about the Scriptures that we can observe for ourselves and see that they are, in fact, the Word of God. The Scriptures are self-attesting. They testify to themselves that they are the Word of God. We don't go to a higher authority, such as the church or various theologians or experts, to determine whether the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible testifies to itself that it is the Word of God, and because it is the Word of God, we must accept that testimony. It is true. There can be no higher standard than Scripture itself. Having said that, when we look at the Scriptures, we find in the Scriptures everything that we would expect to find in a word from God. The Scriptures are one harmonious uh, collection of stories, histories, uh, theology, that all fits together to one consummate theme of Jesus Christ coming to rescue us from our sins, salvation only in Him. There is a grand unity to the whole of Scripture, that is marvelous to see where you have many different authors writing over many different years, centuries, and yet a consistent progressive revelation all pointing to Jesus Christ, His cross and resurrection. That is one evidence that these writings, separate in different ages with different authors, are the Word of God, who alone is the single overriding author. But then, too, the uh, subject or the theme of the scriptures yields the glory of God. The whole intent of the scriptures, the message, is to magnify God and His glory and not to uh, exalt man and what man is able to achieve or accomplish. This goes against much of what you will find in other religions or in other kinds of writings where man is continually flattered or exalted. Man is able to achieve this, we are able to do that, we are able to we are able to please God on our own in some form or fashion. But the scriptures beat down our pride. They continually uh, humble us before God and make Him alone exalted. We see that in Isaiah's prophecy time and time again. And so outwardly the scriptures give evidence of the fact that they are the Word of God. They change people's hearts and bring, make sinners into saints. But ultimately, it is the Spirit of God bearing witness within our hearts, with the Scriptures, that enables us to perceive that they are, in fact, what they are, the Word of God. Why is it that the same Scriptures that are read by many will, nonetheless, by quite a few, be rejected? They will not see the value of the message. They will not see the unity of the message. They will carp at this and argue with that and not understand the unity of that message. Well. 
In part, it's due to the fact that the Spirit has not opened their eyes to see you and enable them to understand the truths of God's Word. It's only that inward work of the Spirit by which we are persuaded, finally, that this is indeed the Word of God. Let's then read that word this morning by looking at Isaiah chapter 15, uh, a brief chapter of, I think, nine verses, and then we'll go to uh, the first five verses of chapter 16. If you follow along in the Pew Bible, you'll find that on page 690. Isaiah chapter 15. Here is the word of God. An oracle concerning Moab. Ar in Moab is ruined, destroyed in a night. Kir in Moab is ruined, destroyed in a night. The bond goes up to its temple, to its high places to weep. Moab wails over Nebo and Medeba. Every head is shaved and every beard cut off. In the streets they wear sackcloth. On the roofs and in the public squares they all wail, prostrate with weeping. Heshbon and Eliel cry out. Their voices are heard all the way to Jahaz. Therefore, the armed men of Moab cry out, and their hearts are faint. My heart cries out over Moab. The fugitives flee as far as Zoar, as far as Iglath Shelashia. They go up the way to Bavith, weeping as they go. On the road to Horonaim, they lament their destruction. The waters of Nimrim are dried up, and the grass is withered. The vegetation is gone, and nothing green is left. So the wealth they have acquired and stored up, they carry away over the ravine of the poplars. Their outcry echoes along the borders of Moab. Their wailing reaches as far as the glen. Their lamentation as far as the ear the lean. Deman's waters are full of blood. I will bring still more upon Deman, a lion upon the fugitives of Moab, and upon those who remain in the land. Send the lambs as tribute to the ruler of the land, from Selah across the desert to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Like fluttering birds pushed from the nest, so are the women of Moab at the fords of the Arnon. Give us counsel, render a decision, make your shadow like night at high noon. Hide the fugitive, do not betray the refugees. Let the Moabite fugitives stay with you, be their shelter from the destroyer. The oppressor will come to an end, and destruction will cease. The aggressor will vanish from the land. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. One from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of 